More than 3,000 miles from New York City, across the Atlantic Ocean, and off the northwestern coast of continental Europe lies the United Kingdom, which includes England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, a land known for its heather, highlands, and haggis. Welcome to Edinburgh, Scotland, a city built on the remains of an ancient volcano and steeped in history. Perhaps one of Edinburgh's most famous and impressive historical landmarks, perched high atop the city, is the castle, which dates back to the 12th century, almost a thousand years ago. Edinburgh's old town, as it's known, grew up on a narrow hill around the castle where some of its medieval houses reached as high as 15 stories, the earliest skyscrapers. The new town, a network of wide streets, grand public buildings, elegant houses, and leafy gardens was built in the late 18th century. Scotland's second largest city and capital is home to more than a half a million Edinburghers, as the citizens of this beautiful city are known. And you may be surprised to know that many of the world's great thinkers, artists, and writers have called Edinburgh home. People like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Robert Louis Stevenson, J.M. Barry, and of course, J.K. Rowling, who wrote much of the first book of one of the most widely read children's book series of all time in a coffee shop right here in Edinburgh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harry Potter Beyond the Page. I'm Billy D. Michelle with Scholastic, and we are coming to you live from Scotland's capital, Edinburgh the city J.K. Rowling calls home. This is a big day for Harry Potter readers and for those about to begin their magical adventure because, for the first time ever, J.K. Rowling is live in classrooms virtually around the world. Joe, thank you for inviting us to meet you here in your hometown to talk about the fantastic world of Harry Potter. I know you wrote a great deal of it right here right. in Edinburgh. Yep. How much did this beautiful city and its rich history influence your writing? Um, it it had some influence. There are some small things mm. that um, wouldn't have happened in the books if I hadn't been living in Edinburgh. For example, when I was looking for the surname of a particularly arrogant and annoying character uh, whose first name was Gilderoy, um, I happened to be in a church and saw the surname Lockhart, which is a, which is a beautiful surname and a church here in Edinburgh I'm talking about, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how Gilderoy got his surname. So there were small things like that uh, names, um, sometimes street names, gave me detail in the books. But I have to say I'm a writer who can write pretty much anywhere. anywhere. So it was wonderful to be writing in such a beautiful city and uh, this is a place that's got great coffee shops which is where I did a huge amount of writing. <laughs> so that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. And I would say that people here are very um, respectful of your privacy. So I was able to write, into ca write in cafes for a long time. Um, even when Harry Potter was quite well known. So I'm very grateful to Edinburgh for that. That's a great city. It's been five years since the seventh and final book, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, was published in 2007, and the series is still captivating readers. In the United States, teachers and librarians are creating Harry Potter reading clubs in their schools to introduce the series to new generations of young readers. And now, with Pottermore, the new online Harry Potter reading experience, millions more are beginning their Hogwarts journey. Joe, when we announced that we were doing this live event with you, the response from teachers and librarians and students and fans was obviously overwhelmingly so positive. Great. Yeah, And the questions began pouring in. I can't tell you how many, of course, and I'm going to be sharing just a few of them with okay. from students throughout the webcast. That's perfect. But out of all the questions we received, the one most frequently asked is, one that you've answered, asked, been asked and answered countless times before. But I think with the series now a few years behind you, it's uh -huh. worth revisiting because it speaks to the phenomenon of Harry Potter. And okay. I want to revisit those numbers for a moment. 450 million books in print worldwide, 73 languages, 150 million books in print in the U.S. alone and counting. It's staggering. And I think the question they all want to know most is, do you have any idea why these books have and continue to enchant readers, young and old, in such epic proportions? I've ha I, I have thought about this. Mm -hmm. I used to say, because it was an easy answer, oh, you should ask the readers, you know, they know what they right. like. But over the years, I have 
come to understand the appeal a little better, mainly through talking to readers, I'd have to say. I think primarily people fell in love with the characters. Even though the magic is so much fun and the idea of this hidden world is so appealing, it's appealing to me as the author and, and as an adult, the idea that there's somewhere special that you belong. Mm. Um, I still think that it was the characters fundamentally that made people fall in love with the world and above all, Harry, Ron and Hermione probably. Right, and we're going to talk about the characters because you're right, they're extraordinary. But I wanted to ask you, going back a little bit, was it always your dream to write? Always, and always. I literally cannot remember a time when I knew that you had to earn your living in some way mm. and I didn't want to be a writer. And sometimes I, I, was, I was not very honest about that because I think, well, I know, my parents wouldn't have seen that as a very stable way to make a living, but it was always what I wanted to do. And in my heart of hearts, I knew that that's, I was going to try as hard as I possibly could to write. And were you concocting stories even as a... Yeah, definitely. <laughs> the first, yeah, the first um, book, so-called, I ever wrote, <laughs> I was six years old, and it was about a rabbit called Rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see that. That's... Yeah, it's not very good. No? <laughs> but, okay. but, but, it, but what's, what, in retrospect, what's impressive about it to me is that I finished it. You see, I think that is the mark of someone who really wants to write. Right. Because beginning stories is often very easy. Finishing them, not so much. Right. All right, this next question is one of the first from students that I was talking about. Great. It's from uh, Christy Crawford's fourth and fifth grade group at Bronx Community Charter School in New York City. Perfect. Let's take a look. That's such a great question. Um, I had several write, um, teachers who, who did encourage me to write. Um, I can remember I had a couple of primary school teachers who, in reading out my work to the class, made me feel very, very special. They, re they really did. And I, that sticks out in my memory. The pride I felt at my work <laughs> being yeah. read out to other students was, was a very big deal to me. Um, I had a teacher when I was a little older um, called um, Lucy Shepherd, and her name springs very readily to my lips because I've just met her. I just did an event and she came along to it and she was teaching me when I was in my teens and she was a fantastic English teacher. And like Dumbledore and McGonagall in the books, she taught me things in addition to what she was teaching me about literature, things about life. You know, she was just a very good example of a woman who was very smart and um, someone who um, would stick up for herself and her right. principles, and that was, a, that was a great role model. And that kind of validation to at a young age. Oh, really complete, sort of, yeah. completely. I mean, yeah. you never forget the teachers who right. said to you, you, you can do this. Right. <laughs> do you remember the first sentence you wrote in the series, and the last, and how much time between? Um, well, I know that it was 17 years between the two. 17. And I know that I finished writing... Um, Deathly Hallows in 2007. Uh, I finished editing it, I should right. say. So I couldn't tell you what was the very last word I wrote because when you're editing, you, you're darting around a lot. The first sentence I wrote, I do um, still have. If we're setting aside the preliminary notes that right. I made, um, and it was so different to the first sentence that appeared in the printed books. And it was, um, I can't quote it exactly, but it was to do with a place called Dark's Hollow. And Dark's Hollow became Godric's Hollow. So in the very first ever version of chapter one of the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, you saw what happened in Godric's Hollow. Whereas in the finished series, you don't get to see exactly what happened in Godric's Hollow till much later. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, one of your fa maybe one of your favorite moments along the way in these 17 years? Um... There are, there are so many, within the books, if we're talking about what happens in the stories, uh, I know that I'm about to read one of, them, one of my very favorite pieces right. to you from the first book, but there, there are many. Um, Luna's first appearance, because I love Luna Lovegood so much, and I was She's looking so forward great. to writing her. Um, the graveyard scene in, I have to be very careful for yep. people who haven't finished the series, right. but the graveyard scene in Goblet of Fire. Um, 
for different reasons, was great to write because I'd been aiming for that point for quite a few years by the time I got to write it, so that felt very satisfying. Mm -hmm. So the loads of different, some just really small things that I still remember enjoying writing, um, like uh, stupid jingles and things that G Peeves says. <laughs> they were always fun to do. And how about a personal favorite moment, like a lot in those 17 years? For me personally, yeah. as the writer, yeah. there have been so many, but I think the... Um, the second American tour that I did was unbelievable, was unbelievable, because at that point the books had become very popular and I'd, I hadn't been exposed to how popular they'd become, um, physically exposed to it. And I can remember <laughs> travelling in a car towards my first signing and uh, there were blocks and blocks of people queuing. And I said to um, Chris Moran, who, uh, who was uh, working from Scholastic and who has really become a good friend, and we were sitting in the car, I said, Chris, is there a sale on? <laughs> and she just looked at me, are you mad? This is for you. And that was, you know, I will never forget that moment. That was the first time I really understood what has happened. Right. It yeah. was a great moment. Too. It was extraordinary yeah. and also terrifying. You know, it was, yeah. it was scary as well, because I just hadn't expected that. The previous tour, although we'd had, you know, maybe a couple of hundred people turn up occasionally, it, it hadn't been quite that crazy. Yeah. Well, it's because you created one of the most magical worlds Thank you. ever, probably, or one of the most magical worlds you've ever seen in literature, for sure, and, and some of the most, as we said, extraordinary characters. So... Yeah. I know you said, for all of these readers watching who are about to start their journey and for those who've been on it even multiple times, would you take us back into that world? I would love to. And I would really love to. Sorcerer's Stone, right? Yeah, I'm okay. going to read from Sorcerer's Stone and I'm going to read. Um, now, I absolutely loved writing this passage and in fact, I started writing this sitting under a tree <laughs> in, a, in, the, in a park, uh, which is appropriate and you will understand why it's appropriate when I've read a little more. Okay. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read, Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place except for a single spindly chair that Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too because there was a loud crunching noise and he got quickly off the spindly chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes, I thought I'd be seeing you soon. Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself, buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favoured a mahogany wand. Eleven inches, pliable, a little more power, and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favoured it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where... Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches. You. Powerful wand, very powerful, and in the wrong hands. Well, if I'd known what that wand was going out into the world to do... He shook his head and then, to Harry's relief, spotted Hagrid. Rubeus! Rubeus Hagrid! How nice to see you again! Oak, sixteen inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one. 
But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Er, uh, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I've still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid. Harry noticed he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand hand? Uh, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm, that's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and round his head. As he measured, he said, Every Ollivander wand has a core of a powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heartstrings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And, of course, you will never get such good results with another wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realized that the tape measure, which was measuring between his nostrils, was doing this on its own. Mr. Ollivander was flitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said, and the tape measure crumpled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr. Potter, try this one. Beechwood and dragon heart string, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around a bit, but Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and phoenix feather, seven inches, quite whippy. Try? Harry tried, but he had hardly raised the wand when it too was snatched back by Mr. Ollivander. No, no, here, ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, try it out. Harry tried and tried. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was moving higher and higher on the spindly chair, but the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder now, yes, why not? Unusual combination. Holly and Phoenix feather, 11 inches, nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head, brought it swishing down through the dusty air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light onto the walls. Hagrid whooped and clapped, and Mr. Ollivander cried, Oh, bravo! Yes, indeed! Oh, very good! Well, well, well! How curious! How very curious! He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, Curious! Curious. Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather. Just one other. It is very curious. Yes. Thirteen and a half inches. You. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember. I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes. But great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed them from his shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Hagrid made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked out down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawking at them on the, on the underground, laden as they were with all their funny-shaped packages, with the snowy owl asleep in its cage on Harry's lap. Up another escalator, out into Paddington Station, Harry only realised where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. 
You all right, Harry? You're very quiet, said Hagrid. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He just had the best birthday of his life, and yet he chewed his hamburger trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander. But I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Vol... Sorry. I mean, the night my parents died. Hagrid leaned across the table. Behind the wild beard and eyebrows, he wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out and that's always hard. But you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, as a matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Dursleys, then handed him an envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, he said. First of September, King's Cross. It's all on your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys, send me a letter with your owl. She'll know where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the window. But he blinked, and Hagrid had gone. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. I love that bit. I, I really love that, do bit. Love that I, bit. Those first moments in Diagon Alley are classic. I mean, those are like, you begin to really get into this world and see. Exactly. Yeah, it's so cool. Well, let's, actually, let's talk about Harry. Right. And his great friendship with his school, schoolmates, yep. Ron and Hermione. We have a question from Alice who's in year seven at Tolworth Girls' School here in, uh, in, Lond in London, Surbiton. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Okay. How did you first imagine Harry Ron and Hermione's relationship, and how did it change as you got deeper into the books? Well, that's an excellent question, because it goes to the heart of writing a long series. Yeah. Um, I mean, some writers say character is plot, and to a large extent, I think they're right. So um, I gave Harry two friends, two very, very different friends. Ron is all about the fun. Right. And, but Ron is a very loyal person. He's a very human person, in some ways more human than Harry, who is someone who is a hero. A hero is often slightly set apart, um, not so much inhuman as a purified form of a, of a human. Right. They, they're the one who, who must uh, fulfill the quest. So Ron is there as a maybe a slightly more real boy with his faults and his flaws and Ron gets scared and Ron wonders really are we going to have to do this again but he's always there by Harry's side and Ron's one um, problem which is Ron's problem and sometimes his friend's problem is insecurity Ron, Ron feels that he's maybe not as good as his brothers he comes from a very big family and then he goes and makes friends with the most famous boy uh, in the wizarding world and so Ron's got some issues of his own to work through and in doing so Ron goes on his own emotional journey so that's that's Ron's character and that's Ron's plot as it were and I did know all those things about Ron from the start I did know that that was going to be um, the, 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 the issue within that friendship then with Hermione Hermione gives Harry, so Harry is a boy who needs some fun, and he gets that from Ron. Harry is also a boy who, even though he's been marked out for this strange destiny, he's someone who doesn't know a lot. And that's where Hermione comes yeah. in. Now, Hermione is all about knowing stuff. Right. So I give him these two friends who bring to Harry things he needs. Hermione is very clever. She not only knows a lot of stuff, she knows where to find out a lot of stuff. So, um, and she, but she too goes through a journey through the books. So Hermione learns to loosen up quite a lot, largely through the influence of uh, Ron. Hermione learns that there is more to life than book learning, a lesson that really she learns quite early on, and then she grows a lot as a person. So I did know those things about those characters, even from the first book. And um, I think I needed to, because I would have run out of steam quite early on if I hadn't given them the potential to grow as, as people. But you know, What's so compelling, too, as a reader, is that you're, you watch and you feel this bond right. develop right. between. Because also, because Ron and, 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 and Hermione challenge Harry in their... Very much very so, much and that, that's what keeps the relationship interesting. 
um, in, in that there is conflict within it, as there is with all human relationships. Absolutely. Even the deepest and the warmest friendships will be subject to trials. And what marks out a truly great friendship is not that it never had an argument or never saw any conflict. It's how you deal with those it things. Survived it. It, 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 it survived it. It survived it and became stronger yeah, because absolutely. you had to be honest and you had to find a, a way of coping with those, with those difficulties. So, yeah. But the other thing, too, is that as a reader, we... It, we feel like we're experiencing the journey alongside them. And that journey is actually more than just about magic, isn't it? Completely, because as, as we're saying, you know, these, these are three characters who's, who's, without wishing to be corny or cheesy, they, what they really need to learn about is themselves. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, need to learn about each other, but self-knowledge is, is key. And without giving too much away again, when we get to Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, what the Hallows are and what they represent reveals a lot about the people who seek them, want to use them, and being drawn to a particular Hallow tells you something about the kind of person you are. And by the time they get there, Harry, Ron and Hermione are equipped to come near such objects. And that was an emotional journey that had very little to do with magic. So you're writing these three characters. Yep over an extended period of time. How much of you ends up in all three of them then? I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a, a good argument that says that, you know, you, uh, an author is in every single character they write. They have to be. You have to understand from the inside what someone's going through, which means that you have to put yourself in a lot of different heads. Mm -hmm. With Harry, Ron and Hermione, absolutely. There's, I am in all three of them. Harry is a curious character. He's not often the most popular um, character in the books for a good reason, because he has to be this, um, this questing person. And often that person is, as I say, slightly less easy to love, yeah. because their flaws tend not to be run-of-the-mill flaws. But Harry, um, Harry is often the bystander, the eyes onto the world. Um, and that gives him a particular power. He is slightly detached. Detachment isn't a very lovable quality. But often people who have that detachment are rather unusual and are able to do things. And most writers have a degree of detachment. So if I stand right back from those three characters, I would say that is the part of me that maybe is in Harry. Hermione is easy. I mean, Hermione is, a, is an exaggerated version of myself hmm. at that age. You know, she's not exactly like me, but I was certainly a very bookish girl, and I was the girl who would have gone to the library to look it up. You know, that's how I would have reacted to the challenges of Hogwarts. I mm -hmm. would have gone to find a book. And Ron, there's a lot of me and Ron, and a lot of Ron's um, most base humour is stuff that <laughs> would make me laugh. I'm not saying that's the only stuff that makes me laugh, but I love Ron's humour, and obviously that comes from me. I'm making up the jokes, so there you are. But, you know, as readers, we, we identify with all of them. And largely because, in some way, they're dealing with the same things that we're struggling with, right? Absolutely. One of my favorite ever comments from a, from a very early reader, and I mean really early, like back in 90, 97, 98, was a, was a young, small boy, he was about 10 years old, and he looked at me and he said, I really like this book. And I said, well, thank you so much. He said, Harry often doesn't know what's going on, and nor do I. And that spoke to me so much because I think at that age, you know, he was semi-joking, but he meant it at the same time. And I thought, that's perfect. You've just summed it up. All of us having this sense of, am I the only one who doesn't know what's going on? That We've all felt that. And I think when you're young, starting a new school, that those feelings are never as acute as at that time. And, and not always... You're not always conscious of the fact that you're, there's this struggle going on, right? So it's these bigger themes of... Good versus evil, tolerance sure. versus intolerance, sure. love, hate. Mm -hmm. All of that is mm -hmm. permeates their characters and all of the characters in the book. And this next question from Donalyn Miller's fourth grade class at O.A. Peterson Elementary School in Fort Worth, Texas, speaks to that. Let's listen. Hi, my name is Mason. Did you know when you were writing the books that reading about Harry, Ron, and Hermione's experience would help us face our own challenges? Hmm. Did I know... That's such a great question. I probably didn't know. Because when you're writing, you, you're so inside the world. You're living it. You're feeling it. It's, to be honest, the last thing on your mind is, how will someone read this? You're too busy creating it. It was only later that I thought, wow, 
um, you know, when I started to get letters, particularly about bullying, things like bullying, mm -hmm. um, I've had so many letters from boys saying there's a Draco Mal Malfoy in my class, or yeah. girls saying, I know some Pansy Parkinson's. And that, that meant the world to me in the sense that I hope that people dealing with those issues would think, well, you know, I'm not alone. Some people just are mean, and it's nothing to do with me, and I've got to find a way to na navigate around those people because... Yeah, so that was a great thing to hear. It right. was a wonderful thing to hear, yeah. and that's, that is a wonderful question to It's to a great have. question. Yeah. All right, so here in the UK, it's been 15 years yeah. since uh, the first book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, was published in the US. We're going to be celebrating that anniversary this, for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone next September. Right. And a lot has changed in 15 years. Definitely. Technology's gotten us further into the digital yeah. age. How we receive our information, certainly online, is very different. We spend a great deal more time online. Sure. Um, and today we're talking about books and reading live on the internet uh -huh. and how we read. Has Books changed. Has yeah. changed dramatically. Yeah. And so you're taking this magnificent series and extending it beyond the page into this rich digital world yeah. called Pottermore. Yeah. And Katya, in Cecile Robertson's sixth grade class in Eglinton Junior Public School in Toronto, Canada, wants to know this. Fantastic. <laughs> Hi, JK Rowling! Hi, I just wanted to ask you a question. How did you come up with Pottermore.com? How did I come up with Pottermore? Pottermore. Okay. It was, I, I mean, the initial idea was it's time because a lot of fans were saying, when are we going to get ebooks? Right. When are we going to be able to read in a different form? And it felt like it was the right time to do it. You know, I, I had time to concentrate on doing it right. So that's, that's really where the idea for Pottermore came. Um, but then I wanted it to be more than that, inevitably, <laughs> because, as you say, the Internet is, has amazing possibilities wow. that were n no one dreamt of in 97 when, I, when the first Harry Potter book was published. So I saw it as a way to create um, an environment where you could see extra tidbits, you know, you, mm -hmm. we could go inside illustrations a little bit. I mean, it's just, it's, it's making a book in that world. It's just putting a book in that world and you can do some wonderful things there. It's still a reading experience, you know, you still need to be able to read mm -hmm. the books. Um, but I was excited about the fact that we could put a really good reading experience online. And I think it's very important to say that you can get a whole load of extra stuff on Pottermore completely for free. So this isn't just about selling books right. to anyone, right. though you can buy the, the ebooks there if you want to. But the really exciting thing for me was I had a way, and this you can get completely for free if you, if you go on there, I had a way of putting extra material that I'd collected over the years, or that I still wanted to find out about myself. So some, some little bits and pieces I've invented since. And I could put it online, and it was a way of making sure that any fan could access it. They could, you know, they could just play with it a little bit more and it's the kind of thing I would love if I loved a series of books to be able to go out and fi to, to be able to go and find more about a character a little bit of extra backstory I would have adored so it was a chance to do all of that and as you say still be reading exactly books, right? it's, it's still a reading experience yeah. yeah well we have a little preview of okay. what wonderful things await you on Pottermore let's take a look
That is so cool. I love it. There, and there's so much excitement about Pottermore. It's been, you know... We had an amazing team working right? on it. We um, really did, and I've been so involved. And in fact, you saw it. You saw a hint of what's uh, what's really fun on there. So you can, you you get your wand and you get sorted in the house. And I think that that's been very popular with users. So, yeah. You can explore. And I devised all of that. I had so much fun with that. All right, so, so and I think there's thirty thousand and something wand combinations you can get. Oh so you really get a really personalised wand. Okay, then I, we all want to know what excites you most. Then because there's been so much excitement, but what excites you most? Um. To be honest, on this occasion, it has been getting feedback from people. Yeah. I've had I've had so many people say to me how much fun it is. Um, and yeah, I suppose devising the the um, the definitive um, questions for for that for the different houses was a lot of fun because there have been so many pale imitations online. It was time this for was me you. to do it. Mm. Yeah. All right. So everyone has their favorite moments. I know I do already. Um, Stacy Burt's sixth grade class from the Discovery School in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, is very interested in knowing yours. Let's take a look. Greetings to one of our favorite authors, J.K. Rowling, from Discovery School in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We're right here from Miss Burt's sixth grade class, and we've been wanting. What are your favorite moments from Harry Potter and Dunn? <laughs> That's so nice. I'm loving the owls. Yeah. Um, my favorite moment in um, Sorcerer's Stone, um, well, actually, funnily, you should say Diagon Alley being the moment that you go into the magical world mm. is, is a great moment on Pottermore, yeah. I think. I love the illustration. And just to be able to move through the shops and pick, thing, pick things up, and, you know, it's, it's like, I mean, at my age, Pop-up books were really exciting. <laughs> so this is like the ultimate pop-up book, isn't it? You see, with the illustrations. That's and they, there's that slightly yeah. 3D effect that you can move through. And that was very conscious because when I wanted the style of the site to remain very book-like. So the illustrations aren't filmic. They look much more like book illustrations, mm -hmm. like pop-up illustrations, which I love. Uh, you said there's lots of new, mm -hmm. exclusive content, probably, yeah. probably a fraction of what's in your Correct. head, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and Adam Carlin's, this is very creative fifth grade class at Turtleback Elementary School in San Diego, California. Great name. What's it called? Turtleback, Turtleback, Turtleback. Elementary. Love mm -hmm. that. They want to pick your brain a little bit. And okay. I'm gonna, this comes with a warning. Mm -hmm. There are special effects. Okay. I'm ready. Hi, J.K. Rowling. You inspire us. <laughs> Have you enjoyed returning to Harry's story again? And have any of the characters come back and surprise you? <laughs> that is... I have to say Turtleback has, has, has yeah. won so far. <laughs> best presentation. That, that was awesome. Um, first of all, returning to Harry's story, I don't honestly feel like I ever left. I'm never going to leave. I'm never going to leave. It was 17 years of my life. I was quite heartbroken to finish writing. It was tough, very tough. Going back is so easy, it's ridiculously easy for me. I feel like I'm just unlocking a door back into my own house. And I love that. I love having the ongoing contact. So putting things out of boxes or inventing a little bit more for Pottermore is just fun. And it's a wonderful way to stay connected to the world and to fans of Harry's. So that's all great. Has a character come back and surprised me? I wouldn't exactly say surprised because I did know them all pretty well. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I recently um, completed um, a full biography for Remus Lupin, who is one of my favorite characters in the series. Yeah. And he, uh, he's a teacher that Harry has in the third book, Prisoner of Az Azkaban. And in writing Remus's biography, um, even though I it, I, it was in my head, I'd never written it down, but I kind of knew what he'd done. But in writing it, I found myself getting very upset. That's all I can say because I don't want to give anything away. But I did find myself getting quite emotional. So I can't say any more than that. I can't. I You're can't. getting emotional. I want <laughs> well, it just I felt very connected to that yeah. character, and it was hard going back through his life again. Um. We also have an exclusive first look 
and okay. an illustration oh, perfect. from yeah. Paramore. And uh, we're going to take a look at it right now. It's exquisite. Isn't that beautiful? What are we looking at? I think it's inside the night bus. That's the night bus, exactly, yeah. Which is really how I imagined it. It's so funny because it looks so serene and comfortable, doesn't it? It and does. Then, and then the, mo <laughs> the moment the accelerator <laughs> hits the floor, you're in agony and everything's sliding everywhere. Uh, the night bus is fun. I really, I liked the night bus. I love it. It's beautiful. It's got to be a thrill seeing all of this come to life because that's the other thing. It's it is. coming to life. And, and, yeah, it's, be, it's been such a thrill. Uh, partly, it's taken a long time. You know, we... I say we because it's a big team of creators who've, d who've, mm -hmm. who've worked, um, worked on this project and it's been a few years and people kept saying, when are you going to do e-books, when are you going to do e-books? I couldn't say because we were working on what we hoped would be a really great reading experience online. Um, and finally see it come to life it's, it has been wonderful. I'm, at, I'm logged on as a normal, yes, as a, as a, you know, a participant. I wanted to have the experience just like everyone else, so That's I'm on great. there. I'm, I'm, so there, we polled yes. a lot of more fans, Fantastic. many of them. Great. We asked them what question they most wanted you to answer. Okay. And close to 40,000 people voted. Wow. And the question they selected with 40% of the vote, which is, uh, which Pottermore house are you in? Well, as, yeah, that's a great question. Because <laughs> as I say, I, I know how it works. So I logged on. And I'm now on Pottermore as a regular user. And uh, that's how I go check what's going on. Mm -hmm. Although I'm not going to give my name. And uh, <laughs> my username. And so I went through the sorting. And I am a, you know me, Billy. What do you think I am? You have to be Gryffindor. I am Gryffindor. Yeah. But I had a moment as I clicked the, la the answer of the last question. And bear in mind, I wrote the question. <laughs> I thought hey, I'm not sure if I've answered to get Gryffindor. I answered them completely honestly. And I, did kn I, had, I knew that I'd answered a couple for different houses, so I thought, I wonder how they're going to work this out. And yes, I am in Gryffindor. Well, that leads me to this very next interesting question from Dhruv. He is in year seven at Tiffin School in Kingston-upon-Thames. Let's listen to what Dhruv has to say. Okay. What would you say to people who are disappointed that they've been thwarted into Hufflepuff on Pottermore? <laughs> well, yeah. this is a this is uh, that is actually my favourite question so far because this is a very sore point for me. Okay. This is, may surprise people, but it is the truth. In many many ways, Hufflepuff is my favourite house. Here's my reasoning. Bear with me. Again, I don't want to... The Gryffindors comprise a lot of foolhardy and show-offy people. That's just the way it is. I'm a Gryffindor, I'm allowed to say it. You know, there's bravery and there's also showboating. <laughs> and sometimes the two go together. The Hufflepuff stayed for a different reason. They weren't trying to show off. They weren't being reckless. That's the essence of Hufflepuff House. Now, my eldest child, my daughter Jessica, said something very profound to me, not very many days ago, actually. She said to me, and she, by the way, was not sorted into Hufflepuff House, but she said to me, I think we should all want to be Hufflepuffs. I can only say to you that I would not be at all disappointed to be sorted into Hufflepuff House. But I'm so I'm a little upset that anyone does feel that way. But you are a Gryffindor. But I, yeah, I am a Gryffindor, but that's that. You know, that's not all good. <laughs> yeah, can no, I? I know Harry's yeah. a Gryffindor, but Harry's a Gryffindor for the same reason I'm a Gryffindor. You know, 
well, you know, I've got a short temper. Harry's got his, got his issues. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All right. Also, Gryffindor hasn't, despite the way it thinks of itself, it's turned out the odd dark wizard. Hufflepuff's got a pretty much clean That's record on that front. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes, you see. All right, Hufflepuff, there. As indeed Slytherin has turned out, out the more than one hero. That's right. Yeah. All right. Yes. Pottermore, up and running. Up and running, at last, thank goodness. 450 million books. <laughs> yeah, that's a few. What's next for you? What are you working on? Uh, more books. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely more books, yes. I'm, well, right now, um, I'm still um, promoting, and will be for a few more days, um, the last book I published, which is a book for adults. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Um, thank you very mm -hmm. much. But I think that the next thing I publish is likely to be a book for children. I, the reason I'm not committing myself wholeheartedly <laughs> is because after 15 years of being the writer of Harry Potter where you'd say something and someone would seize on it and say, right, she's definitely doing that now, and you kind of felt you weren't allowed to change your mind and it all got a little intense. So I, I try not to commit myself too much with my plans. So I'm not 100% sure what I'll do ne next, but I think it will be a book for slightly younger children. I think that will be the next thing I publish. Well, we will await it. Thank you. For whenever. For whenever. It yeah. Thank you. Exactly. All right, I did some of my own writing. <gasps> Actually, on. rewriting. Rewriting. Yeah. Okay. So there's a great French novelist. His name is Marcel Proust. Yes, indeed. He's penned a very famous questionnaire, which a lot of people have used. Indeed. I adapted it. Okay. A little bit. That's scary. Own, <laughs> my own version, just for you. Okay. Lucky you. Are you ready to answer? I'm ready. Okay, here, now, first thing that comes to your mind, because it can go fast. Okay. All right. Okay. Gosh, that is scary. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Favorite color? Pink. I knew! <laughs> you're supposed to be going fast! <laughs> I'm sorry. Favorite food? Sushi. Least favorite food? Oh, tripe, mm. which, which I have eaten, because well, I'll try anything let's and it, move on. It, it's tripe. as bad as oh, it looks. Yeah. Favorite sound? Ooh, um. The sea or my husband snoring. <laughs> Least favorite. I've heard the sea. <laughs> Least favorite sound. Um, my husband snoring when I want to get to sleep. <laughs> favorite sport. Quidditch, obviously. Yeah, well, yeah, of course. Okay. Favorite host who's ever interviewed you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, favorite. <laughs> favorite thing to do when you're not working. Um. Take my kids out somewhere fun, or I, I, I'm quite a creative person. I quite like I like to draw, um, listen to music. Not very exciting answers, are they? But yeah, that's yeah. the truth. Yeah. Oh, and I love cooking. I love to cook. Yeah. And baking. Yeah, I love to bake. Yeah. Mm. Quality you most admire in a person. Bravery. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a good it, answer. Yes. Okay, this is the last of the questionnaire. Complete the sentence. If I wasn't a writer, I would be... Depressed. <laughs> <laughs> is that there's a profession? No there's nothing <laughs> else. There's just nothing else yeah. that I would want to do. My youngest daughter said to me, not, again, not very long ago at all, she said, Mommy, if you had to choose between us and writing, what would you choose? And I said, I would choose you, but I would be very grumpy. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you for going along with that. That was yeah. fun. Yeah. Yes. I have so many more we can, <laughs> we can talk. Everyone said it, Harry Potter, massive success. But you've said this many times, Joe, that getting kids reading has been one of the most gratifying outcomes of writing the Harry Potter series. So 20 years from now, 50 years, 100 years from now, when they're still being read, what do you most hope that children take away with, with them from reading, from the experience of reading Harry? What I would most like to think they take away is what I take away from my favorite books, which is the knowledge that there's always somewhere you can go that you love and where you're safe. And that's how I feel about my favorite books, that wherever I am, if I've got that book with me, I have got a place I can go um, and be happy. Mm. So if that, that, if that place is Hogwarts for anyone, then I'm, I couldn't be more honored or more humbled.
And it's made a lot of people happy. Thank you. It has. Thank you for spending time with us, for answering I've loved all of it. these questions. And amazing questions. Really wonderful, wonderful questions. But thank you for this gift, because it is. It's a gift. It's been a gift for generations of readers already and, and more to come. And it's been a pleasure for me to be with you here today. Thanks so much, Billy. Yeah. I've really loved it. Thank you all for tuning in. We're so glad you could join us virtually here in this gorgeous city of Edinburgh. And remember, for all things Harry Potter, you can visit scholastic.com slash hpread, where you can learn more about the new Harry Potter Reading Club, bloomsbury.com slash Harry Potter, and of course, new online Harry Potter reading experience at pottermore.com. Many options, but they all lead to J.K. Rowling's magical world of Harry Potter. Have a great day, and keep reading. Thank you.